How many people are familiar with Lean Startup? All right, I see a, a couple hands. All right, so I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of Lean Startup. So Steve Blank is considered the founder of the Lean Startup movement. And it's built on what he would call a number of big ideas. I'm going to go over three of those big ideas. So first, startups are not just small versions of large companies. So a company executes a business model. Startups are searching for business models. As a result, a startup founder has to emphasize getting out of the building, getting in front of actual customers in order to verify whether or not you could build something or you can offer a service that anybody wants. Then as an extension of that, when you think about your product or your service, instead of building that thing or presenting the surface that has all of the bells and whistles, what you want to build is something we call a minimum viable product, something that you can quickly develop, give to a customer, get feedback, and iterate. So at the heart of the Lean Startup movement is this idea of experimentation. So this idea has spread from Silicon Valley all across the US. And in 2012, President Obama noted that most new jobs are created by startups or small business. So they were at the heart of the economic recovery. And that idea is not limited to the US. It spread throughout the world. So you see startup ecosystems everywhere. So how do we capture that power and use it for economic recovery? So we want to deep dive a little bit into an ecosystem and look at how they, they operate. So we might start off with talent, an entrepreneur with an idea. Generally, you can't build that company by yourself. So you'll go to an event. Maybe it's a pitch event. You'll share your idea. There you're able to recruit additional people to your team. From there, you might look for additional help. You go to a physical location, an accelerator, an incubator. Be connected to a mentor. Be connected to training. So we can look at what's happening in DC, the diversification of the economy in DC, and see the power of startups. See the power of incubators and accelerators, right? It's not, it's not random that we see an outgrowth of those while we see this economic growth in DC because they connect you to other parts of the ecosystem. For example, it might connect you to markets where you can do discovery. You can get in front of people that you wouldn't have otherwise in order to test your ideas. They might be able to use your MVP, tell you whether or not you have something that's viable. So you can't discount the power of networks. And then of course, when we think about startups, everybody thinks about that $100 million investment. Right, that's a big part of what fuels the startup revolution. You might start with friends, families, and fools, but then you'll end up with a big round with venture capitalists. So all of these elements work together to fuel the, the, the growth of startups. So what you might not have seen is the team that I'm using is from the HBA, HBO show Silicon Valley. And there's a reason behind that, because we literally have a picture of an entrepreneur from Central Casting. This is what an entrepreneur is supposed to look like. Hoodie, check. Jeans, check. Young white male, check, check, check. But if we want to grow economic recovery in this country, think about the places that most need recovery. The people don't look like this. We have to have a different narrative, right? We have to think about it differently. And so as I thought through that idea, I thought we've been here before. We've been to a place where young people in hoodies and jeans launch multi-million dollar ventures, except that person looked like this, right? Or they look like this sister. So does anybody know who this is? All right, so, right, so that's Q-Tip from the startup called Tribe Called Quest. Now you might not think about them as entrepreneurs, but these are entrepreneurs. And let's, so let's explore that. Let's use the same ecosystem and explore that idea. So we start off, everything's identical. 
Instead of the entrepreneur I had before, let's put Q-tip there. So again, I need to fill out my team. So I'll go to an event. Maybe I'll go to open mic. Right? I'll spit my verses. I'll get other people attracted to my idea. DJ, hype man, maybe another rapper. Right? But you don't go immediately to the record company, press an album, right? That costs millions of dollars. What you do is try to create an MVP. So when I was in high school, you go to somebody's basement, turntable, mic, cassette tape, make something, bring it to school. People tell you if it's hot or not. You think about some of the best hip hop songs. They were just MVPs, right? You know what? Your peep is lauded on it. How could you get more prototype than this, right? Two brothers, one on the beatbox, one on the mic, no other technology. You could do that anywhere. So MVPs are built into hip hop. When, we, when I have my team, now I'm looking for how I can grow that. Again, I go to a physical space looking at how I connect with the network. It's not called an accelerator, it's called a studio, right? I can get mentorship, training. I can connect to other parts of the network. Right, DJs, radio stations, club owners, all to get in front of my customer and get quick feedback. And if we think about hip hop, if you think MVP is intrinsic to hip hop, think about customer discovery. Hip hop was born in customer discovery. So you had DJs looking at how people responded to music. Realized the breakbeat was most important. Loop just the breakbeat. Allowed somebody to come over and start rapping. Customer discovery at its finest. And pitching, these guys pitch the same way that startups do, except instead of angels and venture capitalists, we're talking about labels and record companies. So the narrative is there. The narrative is there. We can tell the story of black entrepreneurship. But what else do we need? We need that studio, that startup studio, to connect people to other parts of the network to really grow the economic recovery that we need for our communities. So I'm gonna bring out my partner. He's on. Thank you, Grant. My name is uh, again L. Burns III. Less than 5% of all startups are actually founded by African Americans. And unlike what's going on in hip hop, many of them are facing three major challenges. One, access to capital. Statistics show us that less than 1% of all the African Americans that actually secure funding, uh, they get less than their white and Asian male counterparts. Two, mentors, in, in particular connecting to black mentor networks. Three, talent. How do we actually assemble a core team? We, my colleague and I, believe that historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, can actually be transformed to be this startup studio, taking advantage of the resources and infrastructures to provide the five components for startup ecosystem. And by doing it, HBCUs can position themselves to increase their enrollment by attracting students that are in interested in innovation, entrepreneurship. The universities can become more fiscally sustainable by generating alternative revenue streams and they can produce high quality graduates with 21st century skills. And the startups that become actual companies, the university can become and actually a, a curator of jobs. I often have entrepreneurs come to me and they ask for assistance on how they can actually build a team. And I tell them there's three types of members that need to be on any team. One is a hipster. They bring the cool factor. Two is the hack hackers. They actually build the actual innovation. And then the hustler. They actually try to figure out, how are we going to make money? HBUs can engage their students in a culture of innovation through courses. And not just traditional business courses and entrepreneurship courses, but courses in design thinking, rapid prototyping, human-centered design. They can also expose students to extra and co-curricular activities such as hackathons and maker events, and pitch and business competitions, and of course demo days where they can get out and actually showcase what they're doing. University can provide support for faculty and researchers to do custom discovery, to actually take what they're doing in the lab and put it on the path to commercialization. 
In addition, the university can provide physical spaces, rapid prototyping spaces, maker spaces, where innovators can actually build, build their products and service so they can get it out to market and actually test whether or not it's a viable product. Many HBCUs already have small business development centers and resources on their campus, but more importantly, HBCUs can actually form as a catalyst uh, to connect uh, startups to mentor networks, and in particular, black and brown mentor networks, such as black founders. Technology has made it relatively easy to access general consumers, but it's pretty hard if you want to get into a specific market, and I'm talking about a market like a financial market. You have to actually know someone in that market. So universities can actually serve as the conduit to connect startups to vertical markets. There are three opportunities that HBCUs can play in bridging the funding gap for startups. One, HBCUs can tap their alumni to form an angel fund. Two, because of the nonprofit status of HBCUs in many universities, Startups that are in the ecosystem and affiliated with the university can actually access non-dilutive methods of funding, grant opportunities from places like VentureWell and the government, and programs like i and SBIR. And lastly, forming partnerships with external investors that have an inclusive mission. I want to showcase some of the things that we're doing, one thing we're doing here at Howard University in our ecosystem. We actually created a course called Bison Startup, and it's part of a larger initiative, How You Innovate. And it actually exposes the culture, the community of Howard University to innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Students self-assemble into teams of hackers, hipsters, and hustlers, and they actually pitch their way into the course. And when they get in the course, they get an infusion of capital, and they're thrown into an immersive learning experience where they're actually challenged by the risk and uncertainty of doing custom discovery using the Lean Launchpad methodology. The overall goal of the course for students is to find a business model that is scalable and repeatable. Students have access to local incubators, such as 1776. They have access to mentors, not only here in DC, but also in Silicon Valley. They leverage the resources on campus, such as rapid prototyping equipment, to build MVPs and get customer feedback. At the end of the course, students find out that there's a science. There's a science to a startup. From the aforementioned activities, students last year have been able to create over 15 startups, ranging from customized hair care products, technology, support gaming, entertainment, and the biotech industry. I would like to bring out my colleague. And we would like to put a call to action out to all of the HBCUs to form an innovation network. So all the entertainers and sports figures who've created funds, the HBCUs are looking to partner with you in order to help our students grow their ventures. We also like to look at reach to all alumni and successful African-American, black and brown technical entrepreneurs for mentorship. All right, and to all HBCU hipsters, hackers, and hustlers, your community needs you. We need to close the economic gap. Get in the game. My name is Legan L. Burge III. I'm Grant Warner. And this is How You Innovate. This is how we do it. What's up, guys? I really All loved right. the presentation. Everything was clean. Everything was clean. Um, right, I know you guys brother. were talking about the Tribe Called Quest, so I'm kind of <laughs> interested. Like, did you, did you guys ever work with any artists? And if so, could you give us some names or name drop? Yeah, that's interesting. So, so the uh, the Tribe Called Quest thing came up because I'm from Queens, so I, I, I grew up not too far from Tribe Called Quest. Uh, and on the flip side of things, so the, the artist I work with is myself. So I started off my first failed startup was my own hip hop career. So, you know, again, <laughs> growing up in Queens, there were studios everywhere. 
So my cousin had a studio, a couple friends had studios. So I was doing the MVP thing. I just couldn't find product market fit. So. Yo, and one more thing, sure. is it possible for me to get your contacts after? Because I think we could be doing something after. All right, definitely. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be around. Let's, let's yeah. connect. Yeah. All right. Hello, my name is Mecca, and I'm a second year medical student at Howard University. Right. And I just wanted to comment on how you guys said there were three people. Um, you need the hipster, hipster, you need the hustler, and you need the hacker. Right. And I just want to say, because I have my own company myself, and I read books like Robert Kiyosaki and Grant Cardone and Dan Klein, all that. And they say the number one thing that any entrepreneur needs is to learn how to sell. Like, that's the most important skill of any entrepreneur. So offering these classes and doing all these networks, do you feel as though those just replace the skills to just learn how to sell and doing door to door and cold calling? Yeah. So, and, so yeah. yeah, so selling is definitely uh, a major skill that is needed for a startup. Yes, I do agree with that. But I think there's, an issue, if you're trying to be innovative, there's the diversity of thought. And so that's why there's that mixture, that mixture of people in the group. But I would also add, so, you know, kind of one of the traps that entrepreneurs fall into is trying to sell, right? So the whole idea of lean, start back, so lean startup is to step back from the sales mode and being search mode, right? Don't assume you have something to sell. Try to understand the customer's needs and values. Yeah. So I think that's the fundamental skill, right? If you, if you learn how to relate to people, then you can sell. But because you can sell doesn't mean you know how to relate to people. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. How you guys doing? All right, how's it going? Good. I'm Professor Green in our department. Yes. And so I know y'all know Def Jam Records. <laughs> Indeed. And Tracy Maitland. Not so a, much, but that's okay. That's a relative of mine. Oh, okay. okay. We love him. We love him. He's tired of me <laughs> asking him for money. Okay? Um, so I learned how to fish, and I just earned a grant. I got a grant. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Now, one of the things I notice when you go around trying to ask alumni and others for money, is you need to coordinate with others who have already asked. Correct. So can you speak to that? Yeah. So, so I think part of the thought process behind it is to generate an angel fund from alumni, right? So you make one ask of alumni, but the money gets pooled into an angel fund. That might be managed at the university. Because again, it gets at this issue. We can't all individually go to alumni and ask, ask for money. So we, we think, you want to make one big ask right, of them, have it go into a, a fund, and then have that fund kind of pool out money. OK, all right. 